This evening, it is my great privilege to bring before you the subject of God's agape. And uh, if you want to write uh, the revised title for tonight's presentation, uh, you could call this Seven Attributes of Perfect Love or Seven Attributes of Agape, whatever suits your inclination. Um, I want to share just a, a personal note before, uh, as we begin tonight's uh, presentation. This, uh, the meaning of this whole 1888 message national conference came home to me very recently as uh, my family and I were traveling to Michigan, moving there from the Philadelphia area where I've taken a leave of absence from the Pennsylvania conference um, to go back to school. And, uh, you know, on a good long trip like that, you know, when I've got one kid and my wife has one kid in the other car, uh, a lot of interesting things can come up in conversation. And I want to tell you about a question that my little boy, who's four years old, asked me. I do have pictures of my wife and kids here if you would like to see them after the uh, presentation tonight. You expected that, right? Um, but in any case, my son, Matthias, who's four, he's going to be five in September. I want to share with you the question that he asked me, and here it is. He said, Daddy, when Jesus was a little boy, did he do wrong things? And then when he got bigger, he did the right things? Now, I want you just to think about that for a minute. And I want you to look beyond the, the apparent theological impropriety there, you know, and realize that this is a four-year-old asking the question. See, I didn't, I didn't immediately respond to his question because I said, okay, now how do I deal with this? I'm not going to say, now, son, you've got it all wrong. You know, Jesus was sinless in character. He never did anything wrong. Uh, you know, that would be the obvious answer that we might want to give. But instead of giving that immediately, I said to myself, what really is my son trying to ask? Because, you know, with a four-year-old vocabulary and a four-year-old mind that was trying to grasp onto heavy concepts, you know, what really is he getting at? And what I came to the conclusion was, is this. My son wanted to know if Jesus could relate to him. Because you see, he's a little boy who struggles to do the right thing. And he was trying to say, Daddy, can Jesus relate to my struggles? That's what this conference is about, friends. It's about a Christ who can relate to our struggles. Amen. It's, it's about a, a Savior who has come into the world and has given life to us and promises that if we appreciate this gift from the heart, that He will take away from us the sins in our character and prepare us to meet Him in peace. Amen. And my son, without really realizing how deep his question was, he was getting at that very issue. Of course, then, then after, the, after I... Kind of after I said, yes, Jesus understands how you struggle, Matthias, I said, but Jesus never did anything wrong. So that's what we're here to discuss, friends. This is the core of the 1888 message. But I have to tell you before, you know, and others are going to speak more on that issue of Christ and his identification with the human family that he came to redeem. But the foundation of that is agape. Because you see, there had to be something that motivated Jesus to want to identify with sinful humanity, to want to redeem fallen man. And the thing that motivated him was his love. I mean, you've read Ephesians chapter 2, you know. You know, it's, it says that it was because of the love of God that uh, Christ came into the world and, you know, reconciled us. I mean, you could, we could take the time to look up that text. But I'm not going to do that at this present time. Instead, tonight, we are going to look at a text that is like your old hometown. I was sharing this with several people uh, this afternoon. I want to illustrate my sermon tonight by asking you to think of the town where you grew up. So, Elder Whelan, what was the town you grew up? St. Cloud, basically. 
And if after you have lived, after you had lived in St. Cloud for five years, how easy would it have been for you to give someone like me who's never been to St. Cloud directions on how to get somewhere? Could you tell me street names, road names? Would it be easy for you? You might be able to because you're a very observant person, but the after five years I should be able to. You should be able to, but would you be able to? Or would you, because you were so familiar with the territory, not even bother to look at the signs anymore because you just knew the way to go? I mean, I think all of us have had that experience at one point or another, where someone would ask us, you know, in a place where we had grown up or we knew very well, how do I get to this point? And you say, well, um, you go up there and go up the road here and, and you take a left and they say, well, what's, the, what's the road name? Um, yeah, it's up there by the uh, Home Depot. Uh, I forget, what was that? And, and, and you'd be tongue-tied, you couldn't remember what the road was because you had long ago ceased to look at the sign. You cease to notice the details when you become so familiar with something. Tonight we're going to look at a few details of a text that is so familiar to us that I think in many times, uh, at least in the Christian world, this is very true. We have ceased to look at the details of John chapter 3 in the 16th verse. It's so familiar. You see it on billboards. You, I have seen it in, in the days in which I was involved in competitive sports years ago. I have seen it in end zones, painted on big signs, John 3.16. That is so, uh, a, such a repeated text in the Christian world that I think by and large, because it's so familiar, we've forgotten to really look at the road signs. We've forgotten to really examine what it's saying. And so that's what we're going to do tonight together with God's help. So all of you know the scripture that I'm going to present to you tonight, probably without even opening your Bible, but I want you to open it anyway. And if you want to repeat it from memory, go ahead, but let's read it together, shall we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is really one of Jesus' most clear declarations of God's agape. It comes within the context of an interview. Here's Nicodemus, the Pharisee, the man who was a leader in the church, and yet he had no conception, no real just conception of the good news. And this is not unlike situations that all of us perhaps or maybe some of us have faced before. And so Jesus is going to give Nicodemus a little uh, Bible study and theological reflection on the subject of agape. Now I want to just take this text phrase by phrase, and in some cases, word by word. And I want you to explore with me the Holy Spirit giving us insight tonight. The significance of this text. Look at the first phrase, for God so loved the world. I want you to ask, the, ask yourself, what does this say about agape? God so agape is the Greek term here, the world. Notice it does not say, for the world so loved God. Am I correct? It says, for God so loved the world. And in another place, John says that we, it is not that we loved God, but that he loved us. So notice who's taking the initiative here. Is it God or is it the world? God takes the initiative. And this is what agape, it, this is one uh, attribute of agape. It is unconditional. God did not sit up there in heaven, friends, and wait for the world to meet certain conditions before he would bestow his agape. Agape is unconditional. The 
Agape, agape originates with God. It's not something that he does in response to anything. Can I say that one more time? Agape is not something that God does in response to something. The initiative is his and his alone. So this is the first thing we learn right off the bat about God's agape is that it is unconditional. Because I want to contrast the, this unconditional agape with paganism. You see, the essence of paganism is man seeking to gain the heart appreciation of God through meeting certain conditions. Let me say that one more time. The essence of paganism is man seeking to gain the heart appreciation of God through meeting certain conditions. Okay, that's what legalism is all about. Now contrast that with agape, with the gospel. Because the essence of the gospel is God seeking to win the heart appreciation of man through giving him the gift of conditions met in Christ. Can I say that one more time? I repeated the first one. Let me repeat this one. The gospel is God seeking to win the heart appreciation of man through giving him the gift of conditions met in Christ. Okay, you see the contrast of the two there? Now, I want to point out something to you here. The, the condition of the world. It says, for God so loved the world. How did the world start out? In a good state or a bad state? Great state, right? State of perfection. The world was created in a state of perfection. Easy to love that kind of a world, right? I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, my wife and I last year had the privilege of going to the Caribbean. We went to the island of Barbados. Something we, we had never done anything like that before. So we went, we enjoyed a few days there on the island. And believe me, there was, uh, it was easy to love Barbados. I mean, you know, the, the people were friendly. The climate was beautiful. Magnify that by 10,000 times what our world was like when God created it. Easy to love. But the world didn't stay that way. And our world, because of Adam and Eve's transgression, fell from this state of perfection to the state in which we know it today. Great paradigm shift. Humongous change took place. And let me ask you this, my friends. Did God's agape change when the state of the world changed? No. no. Because it says right here, and this is a reference to the world as it is in its now fallen condition. For God so loved the world. And I'm glad that word so is there. Isn't that an important word in the text? Don't miss that. For God so loved the world. I mean, this, this is a clue. This is a telegraph or an email, if you will, in today's lingo. This is an email ahead of time that something big is coming. For God so loved the world. It wasn't enough for John, for the Holy Spirit to, to say, John, you need to write, for God loved the world. No, not enough. For God so loved the world. Don't miss that word, so. It's very important. Sending us the message that keep your eyes open because you're not going to believe what you see. So the love of God, even though the world changed, God's love did not change. And this is what, this is the second attribute really of agape. Agape is unchanging. Your heart may change, my heart may change. You know, I may go from believing the gospel, God forbid, to not believing the gospel, but God's love will not change for me. You know, we, when you were born into this world, in whatever state you came into the world, it's the same state that I came into the world too, by the way. When we were born into the world with a nature that is bent towards sin. God's love was operating for us 
before we ever made any move towards Him. And regardless of what decisions people make throughout their lives, agape still operates in the person's life. Do you all say amen to that? Amen. God so loved the world, His love did not change. Now I want to note, take note of uh, the final two words in that phrase, for God so loved the world. And those two words are the and world. There's a key, the, you know, the, of course the key word there is world. God so loved not those who responded, not those who were attractive, not those who were doing their best to serve him. No. God so loved the world. That is a non-discriminatory word. Not those of a certain ethnicity or um, national origin. You know, this is the mistake that the Hebrew church made. They felt that because God had entrusted them with precious truth, that God loved them and them only, and the Gentiles were completely outside the pale of God's care and watchfulness and protection. But that's not true, friends. God's love does not know discrimination. And that's important for us, I think, to realize in the church. Because, you know, we have still issues that we need to deal with along ethnic and racial lines, even within our beloved Seventh-day Advent movement. I know this for sure, because in Philadelphia, before I left, we were wrestling with those issues. And we were saying to ourselves, you know, all the pastors, Allegheny East Conference, which is the regional conference in that area, and uh, Pennsylvania Conference, we would get together, we would talk about it, you know, how can we do away with these distinctions that have come in among us as it relates to race? My friends, the answer to that whole dilemma is not resolutions and policies and things that committees can vote on. It's about agape. That's what's going to bring unity among God's people. When we realize that God's love does not discriminate, we will cease to discriminate because by beholding His agape, we will be changed. I thought we needed to get practical with that one. But God's love does not discriminate even between the just and the unjust. You remember what Jesus said about that issue? Just turn with me for a moment to Matthew chapter 5. I think it's worth it to uh, explore this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Jesus is going to give them the teaching. He's going to repeat to them the teaching that they had heard in primary Sabbath school. Here it is. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. Is that in the Bible? Huh? Yes, that's in the Bible. And hate your enemy. Is that in the Bible? No. Yeah. God did not want them to hate their enemy in the sense that they were hating their enemies. And so Jesus, in, effort, in efforts to straighten them out, says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now, notice how he makes the connection here between what happens on earth in the church and what happens in heaven. You see, what goes on in God's church, friends, is a reflection of what God's church believes about God. Do you believe that? And the way we act towards our families, our spouses, our children, the whole, every relationship that we are involved in, it all comes back to how we view God our Heavenly Father. So he says, act this way that you may be sons of your Father in Heaven. 
For He makes His sun rise on the evil. Oh, you didn't say that, Jesus, did you? On the evil? Really? That's what it says. On the, that you may, that, that, for He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Can you just see that those, uh, the Hebrews there, and their eyeballs are starting to roll back in their heads as Jesus is saying these things. They, they've got to be thinking to themselves, Jesus, you don't really mean that. That God actually blesses people who don't know Him or serve Him? That He actually takes care of them? That He actually loves them? That He doesn't discriminate? But that's what Jesus says. And Jesus goes even further to say, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The idea that God's love is non-discriminatory, that's attribute number three of agape. God does not look at the world and pick out certain ones to love and others to hate. In fact, this is the heresy of Calvinism. Calvinism teaches that God predestined a certain group of people to be saved, that He loves those, but the rest of those are reprobates. The rest of the people in the world are reprobates and He hates them. This is actively taught in some circles in Christianity. But it is foreign to the teaching of Scripture. And I don't know who might be watching this video. Wherever you might be, you might be listening to this uh, presentation on a CD. Might be in your car driving to work somewhere. And maybe all your life you've been wondering, does God really care about me? The answer to that question, my brother, my sister, is absolutely yes. Amen. He has made it his business to get into your business because he cares about you. And the, the, when it says, for God so loved the world, it means exactly that. If you are born into this human family, then you are part of the world that God loves. Now let's move on to the next phrase, because it's really loaded. For God so loved the world. What's next? That He gave His only begotten Son. This is loaded stuff. Notice attribute number four of agape. What were the first three? Agape is, first of all, what? Unconditional. Number two, unchanging. And number three, non-discriminatory. Attribute number four. Agape is active. Do you notice this? It doesn't say, for God so loved the world that he sat up there in heaven and had warm, fuzzy feelings all day. Do you get the point? <laughs> There's nothing like that here. God's love is active. Therefore, after it says, for God so loved the world, it's followed by an action word. Do you see that? God so loved the world that He gave. Absolutely. God's love is not passive, emotional. In fact, agape really acts independently of emotions. How many of you believe that? Raise your hand. Agape acts independently of emotion. Perfect example of that is when Jesus went to the cross. Did Jesus feel like going to the cross? What, how do you know? What's the proof? How many times did He pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Three times. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Do you think that He was just play acting there? Oh no, my friends. Jesus 
did not feel like going to the cross. But agape, thank God, acts independently of feelings. Amen. It's active. It is not merely passive or sentimental. This is something very vital, and we need to make sure that we understand this in the context of today's Christianity. Because the whole push and drive in the Christian church today, and I'm talking about in the wider Christian church today, the whole push is towards sentimentalism. That's what the whole, um, you know, all this, this, the new worship style that has come in, the whole drive and push is towards sentimentalism. To make people feel and, and, and shed tears. And not that there, is there anything wrong with having feelings? Is there anything wrong with tears? Nope. But when you make that the primary goal, instead of something that comes as a result of understanding, then you're setting yourself up for a passive, weak, sentimental love that does not really move the heart to any depth. My friends, if we really have agape in the church, the church will move from principle, not from feeling. Amen. And if there are tough decisions that we have to make in our own lives, we will move from principle, not from feeling. Amen. So agape is active. That's attribute number four. Attribute number five is right there alongside. God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave. You know, we're kind of going from the general to the specific here. Yes, agape is active, but it is active in self-giving. Agape is self-giving. When you look at this, I want you to notice what he gave. Because I'm trying to get, to get you to see the level to which agape goes in self-giving. We have it within human nature to give. Isn't that true? There are people who are what we refer to as philanthropists. They give money to charity. Uh, and people will offer and volunteer time. And all of you have known people who have made no profession of Christ but would, quote, give you the shirt off their back. How many of you have known somebody like that, you know? But there's a major world of difference between that kind of giving and the kind of giving we're talking about right here in this text. First of all, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only begotten Son, his monogenes in Greek, the one of a kind. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever owned a one of a kind anything. I don't think I have. <laughs> but no, one of a kinds are usually what? Expensive. Expensive, valuable, right? I mean, it, you know, we, we have um, at Andrews University there, there's, there's, there are down in the basement of the James White Library. They have some very, very old Bibles down there. Very old. Going back to the time of uh, Calvin, I think. Well, those are valuable, right? Because there are so few of them, you know? And, and you, can't, you don't just hand those out and say, here, uh, put your library card in the little box and take this home for the weekend. Uh-uh, too valuable. Can't do it. Well, we have something referred to, or someone, I should say, referred to in this scripture that is not just a one of a kind, but he is the one of the most important kind. Do you get the point? Here you have the only unique son of God. And... He, 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 is as, he, he is as much God as the Father is God. You know, you know what I'm saying? Here is God saying, I am willing to give everything I am to save the human family. In other words, this is, this is the ultimate in giving. 
And I want you to notice, agape is not only self-giving, but it is self-giving to the enemy. You see, we keep going down a level here. We keep going deeper and deeper into this thing. And you see how much more, uh, how, how much wider the gap becomes between what human beings normally call love and what God refers to as His love. You see the gap widening? You see the chasm becoming broader and deeper so that you can no longer talk of the two in the same sentence? You can no longer tell these cute little stories of uh, loving kind acts done by human beings. You can no longer do that and really compare them with the cross. Instead, you must contrast the best act that mankind has ever performed with what God did in giving His Son. You have to contrast. You cannot compare. You know, it bothers me sometimes as a pastor. You know, I have the opportunity to listen to colleagues and and I, I listen to sermons on the internet sometimes, and it really bothers me. It burns me up inside when I hear people comparing even the greatest acts of human love with what God did in giving His Son. You can't compare those two, my friends. You have to contrast them. I mean, think about it. I mean, agape not only gives, but it gives all and gives to the enemy all. Think about what it meant for Jesus just to show up here in this world. Was there sacrifice involved with that? I mean, read Philippians 2. You know, he existed in the form of God. And yet he said, I don't need to hang on to that. I will take upon myself the form of a servant. And then not only did he take upon himself the form of a servant, but he willingly submitted to come into the world and live as humanity must live, to face the struggles and temptations that we must face. And ultimately, of course, to face the ultimate temptation, whether to say goodbye to life forever or to hold on to his life and let us perish. Well, I thank God for the decision that he made. That was really agape revealed. He was willing to get, God himself was willing to give up his own existence for us. That's agape. That's the extent to which agape gives. Now I wanna look at the third phrase in this text for a few moments. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. <laughs> that whoever believes in Him. What aspect of agape comes to view here? How does God... Um, what does God do with his creatures? Does he decide and, and, and coerce us and say, this is the way it is going to be. I have sent my son into the world. Therefore, I don't feel like wasting my time or my resources. So I'm going to make you accept him. Is this what God says? You know, this is, this is really the... The amazing thing of God's love, he goes to the extent that he goes in giving, and yet he leaves his creatures free to make the decision about what they will do with his gifts. Isn't that incredible? I don't know how you are, but I know when, when I, let's just use a very practical illustration. I, you know, I have two small kids. Matthias is four, Stephanie's still two for a couple of days. When we go out to Taco Bell and I buy them a burrito, what do I want them to do with it? 
Eat the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, eat it all. That's right, Todd. You must have some kids too, huh? <laughs> I know. I know you do. And when they start to pick that thing apart and pull the strands of lettuce out and decorate the, the van with them, how do you think I feel about that? Happy? Overjoyed? Oh, guys, great. Huh. I say, Matthias, I want you to eat your burrito. Stephanie, don't pick the burrito apart. Eat it. You're going to be hungry later. And sometimes if we're sitting at the table at home, I'll actually sit down next to them, right next to them, and I will help them eat it. My, my four-year-old son, sometimes if he's really feeling like he doesn't want to cooperate, I'll sit there and feed him like he was a baby. That's not every day now. Don't get the wrong idea. But every once in a while. So how does God deal with us? Does he say, listen, I paid this price. And you are not going to waste what I have given to you. So therefore, you must believe. I'm going to make it so that you have no choice. You're going to take this and you're going to, as it were, eat it. No, my friends, that's not how God deals with us. It's not how he dealt with Lucifer in heaven. It's not because, after all, didn't Lucifer see a revelation of God's agape? You read the Bible, you read the spirit of prophecy. God revealed agape to the angels in heaven because Christ evidently in the far recesses of time took upon himself, he was, he was known then as Michael the Archangel. It appears as though he looked similar to the other angels, or to, to the, I shouldn't say other, to the angels. And there was a time when God said, this is my son. You worship him the same way you worship me. Amen. And the very fact that one who was in very truth God and equal with the Father would be willing to take upon himself uh, by his own volition a role in seeming subordination to the Father. That was a revelation of God's agape to the angels. And yet God allowed Lucifer to choose whether he would respond to that or not. And he allowed Adam and Eve to choose. Even though they had before them the revelation of agape in the creation of the world. He allowed them to choose. And agape will allow you and I the freedom of choice to do what we will with God's gift of Christ. Seventh attribute, if you've been counting, is in this last phrase, should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's interesting that the very same text that speaks about the salvation of the world, by the way, I mean, this is very clear that God saved the world in Christ. God gave Christ to the world gave his only begotten son to the world. And whatever is in the son, he gave to the world. Well, what's in the son? Righteousness? Yes. Life? Justification? Sanctification? Glorification? Wisdom? That's 1 Corinthians 1.30. You know, Christ became all of this to all of us. The very same text that speaks of this precious gift of Christ also speaks of perishing. So whatever perishing is all about here, it has something to do with agape. Would you agree with me? And attribute number seven of agape is that agape demands that sin be destroyed. Agape will not allow, God's love will not allow sin to continue to dominate this world forever. 
God's love will bring sin to an end in this world. I mean, agape demands this. You wouldn't allow the... Uh, if you had the power to stop the misery in this world, you wouldn't allow it to continue, would you? Would you? Uh -uh. And God's act of the final destruction of sin and of the wicked, those who reject the gospel, it is as much an act of mercy as it is an act of justice. God loves us too much to let us go on indefinitely the way we are at the present time. And so in love, he will destroy sin. And unfortunately, those who reject the gospel will be destroyed with sin. As far as I can tell, those principles from this text are the seven principles or attributes of agape. But, but the sermon's not over yet. Because you see, this presentation that Jesus gave here in John 3, someone was listening to this. Who was that person's name? Nicodemus. Let me share with you something that, is, this, that, I, found, have, that I had found troubling over the years. This section of scripture, this, this little pericope, this story, ends in verse 21. You see the end of the, of the, uh, the section here? Jesus says in verse 20, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. End. Period. Stop. And I always wondered. It always bothered me. Well, what did Nicodemus say next? What did he do after hearing this? I mean, here's, here you have the, the one who personifies agape, giving a Bible study on agape. <laughs> Sometimes we think, you know, we, 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 may, we undertake an effort, such as I'm doing here tonight, and you all have done this, some of you at least have done this in a personal setting. You know, give somebody a Bible study on agape. It bothers me that Nicodemus says nothing. In fact, we don't really hear that much more about Nicodemus. He appears once more in John 7, I believe. We don't hear a lot about him after this. And you wonder, why didn't he respond? Don't you ever wonder about that sometimes when you give a Bible study to somebody and you present the precious truth of God's agape love and they sit there and they listen and they walk away and nothing else is said for a while. Does that bother you like it bothers me? I'm troubled by the end of this. And it wasn't until just the other day. <clears throat> I think I must have been driving to work. Um, I have a new job now. Since I took my leave of absence as a pastor for a study, my classes don't start until August 30th, so I'm a construction worker now. And uh, as I was driving to work, which, you know, when it's the type of thing I do, I get lots of time to think during the day as well. But I think I was on my way to work, and I was reflecting on this, and I'm like, why? Why did Nicodemus not say, I agree with you, Jesus, you're right? Or why did he say, Jesus, you know, I don't agree with this, this is heresy? Why did he just walk away? Yeah. What do we know about the later history of Nicodemus? He ultimately became a disciple, right? Don't you remember that? Isn't it? And we all rejoice. We all put up our hands and say, praise the Lord. What did it take for him to become a disciple? He had to see the cross. In other words, it was not just enough for him to hear agape preached. 
to give, have a Bible study given to him on agape. But he had to also see agape before he was entirely convinced. My friends, could it be that the reason that this message has not yet gone like wildfire in the church and in the world, could it be that they are waiting not just to hear the Bible study that we're giving them, could it be that they're waiting to see the demonstration of God's agape in us? Amen. And I know that the world must see that demonstration. They will not be convinced. But unless they see agape demonstrated, and when, when they see a people that is willing to say, <clears throat> make the same, have the same mentality that Jesus had, I'm willing to say goodbye to life forever, if it will mean giving glory to God. When they see that, when they see a people who act on principle instead of emotion, when they see a people who don't discriminate. Hey, listen, don't kid yourself, friends. There's going to be plenty of room for agape to shine even in free America. Some of you heard some of the words that have been spoken during this uh, last uh, year's political campaigns. I was listening to uh, Al Sharpton. Uh, just uh, the other morning on my way to work, you know, and, and, and you have others on the other side of that issue that are, you know, making sharp comments. You know, racial issues are not dead in America, are they? Well, when people see a church who refuse to be locked into what is culturally appropriate, a church that refuses to discriminate. A church that is loving and merciful and yet is just and righteous. I tell you, my friends, when that happens, it will not cause any little stir. We're going to talk about front page news. And it will be then that the Nicodemuses that we labor with today will come and join us and say, they will come boldly and join us and say, this is the truth. I know it's the truth because I see now that it's the truth. Amen. I see what it has done in your movement. And so may God help us that we would not only be able to communicate accurately the concept of agape, that we would not only embrace God's agape ourselves, but that we would also live that agape before the world. That's my heart's desire for you, for me, in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen.